Grab your beverages and turn up your interweb. Solving the world's problems 12 ounces at a time. It's Dudes and Beer. Everybody and welcome to episode 301 of the Dudes and Beer podcast. I am Chris Jordan, your host, coming to you as always. Well, at least as of the last like nine months since COVID hit the world, uh, from Austin, Texas, used to be bebopping around the country, doing my thing, doing AV and the like. But uh, well, since all that, I'm home to roost. So welcome to the studio. Welcome to the show for all those that. Do not tune in regularly. I am Chris Jordan. I am the host of Dudes and Beer. Uh, For episode 301, I think it's good for us to start off um, with a fresh start for a lot of people that have not experienced our show before. The show, uh, though we do not drink a whole lot of beer like we used to, um, the whole idea behind Dudes and Beer is the idea that America was started in a bar by people that did not agree. on religion, spirituality, economics, politics, but they agreed on one thing, and that one thing brought them together. And less than 20% of America participated in that intellectual revolution known as the American Revolution, yet still we were able to topple the mightiest army on the planet at the time. Um, So that is what it takes folks is that collective consciousness that collective idea that despite our differences we can still have conversation despite our differences we can still dig deep into topics we can still change the world together despite what we believe Um, and we need to start to understand why we believe what we believe and accept people for what they believe That is a big, big precept of this show. Uh, And I really, really want to make that just open for people out there to understand because I think we get caught up in a lot of things, even in the definitions of things, uh, which is why we try to demystify a lot of things on this show. Uh, Over here, over my shoulder, is the, the Dudes and Beer guest library, just piles of books from guests. Our guest this evening uh, is the author of Bringing Death to Life, Dr. Mary Helen Hensley, uh, is on the show today to talk about near-death experiences, to talk about her experience with the same, to discuss healing frequencies, one of my favorite topics that we have not discussed on this show in a long, long time. We will be getting to her and those topics uh, here in just one moment. Please do remember that the Dudes and Beer podcast is officially brought to you by podcastcadet.com. If you're a fan of podcasting like I am and just don't know what to do, don't know how to start, want to start up a podcast for your friends, family, fun, church, school, business, whatever, stop on by podcastcadet.com today. That is the website to go to. One-on-one podcast consultation is what they specialize in. Everything from workshops to trainings, Uh, podcast audits if you've already got a show up and running that you just need to hit the next level and figure out how to do that whether it's social media campaigns uh, how to monetize your show how to distribute your show that is what they specialize in folks stop on by podcastcadet.com today podcastcadet.com is the website dudes 20 is the code that you want to use to save twenty dollars on your way out the door our guest this evening is once again Dr. Mary Helen Hensley. I've been looking forward to this episode um, because we have yet to do in 300, now 300 plus episodes of Dudes and Beer. Um, we've yet to, we've done episodes on past life regression. We've done episodes on past life encroaching on present life. We've done episodes on hauntings, exorcisms, all kinds of stuff. But we have yet to dip our toes into the waters of near-death experience. And this is something that I have been fascinated with and so interested in for the better part of half my life right now. Um, Welcome to the show, Dr. Hensley. How are you today? 
I'm great, thank you. I appreciate appreciate you having me on the show. Absolutely. I, like I said, I have been thoroughly looking forward to this because this is a topic that um, I'm I, a lot of the reason I have some of the guests on the show that I do, like Sev Talk, um, who communicates with interdimensional beings, uh, people like Aaron Montgomery who are uh, alien abductees and have had experiences, people like our guests a couple weeks ago um, who, who deal with past life. Um, I myself have had an ecstatic experience in my life that is truly beyond words. I can explain feeling to people but I can't explain to them in words like I can, like the same way that I can the vista of a sunset over Rome, you know? Um, and it's strange to me that this, this moment in my life that moved me to be the person that I am and take the journey that I've taken, I cannot explain to people. Um, and, and to have had an experience with the other side, I mean, at least my understanding, we'll get into that here in a minute, um, to have an experience like that with the other side, with a near-death experience, um, I guess let's let's kind of start at the beginning and how, how all this came to be for you and how your realization of the near-death experience came to be. Well, you know, I just celebrated my 29th rebirthday on oh, the wow. 14th of, yeah, and um, I call it my rebirthday because you know, uh, the first the, the first birth is the one that your your mama has bringing you onto the planet, <laughs> and uh, second birth is the day you actually wake up, and uh, so yeah, December 14th, 1991 was was really that day for me. Wow. Um, if you want to start at the beginning, you know, we, we can take it all the way back to the womb. Oh, well, and, <laughs> yeah. I, we don't need to go back that far, do we? You'd be surprised. Okay. You'd be surprised. All right. Yes. Well, take us far, as far back as the journey needs to go then. I'm going to take you there. Um, my mother was pregnant with me. I was the fourth child to come along, and I was a big surprise. And um, when she was pregnant, she ended up getting the German measles. And so she and my father were called into the doctor and they were told, um, this baby's not going to be okay. You all need to get your head around that now. Um, you know, you're over 40 and, uh, you're in the first trimester of pregnancy and have the German measles and this is not going to work out well. And so off my parents went with this kind of devastating news. And my father was a minister. He was a, he was many things. He was a big American football coach and a very motivational individual in our community, uh, but he was also a minister. And so during the course of my mother's pregnancy, he had what he described as a celestial visit, which is interesting terminology coming from a, a, a church man because he didn't say it was like a visit from the Holy Spirit or angels. These were yeah. celestial beings because he literally didn't have the words to describe what they were. They were light beings that came and took form and spoke to him. And so what, you know, and it was mind blowing for him. But what they said was that not only was his daughter going to be okay. And remember, this is back in the 60s. So we don't have ultrasounds and gender reveals and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. Um, so not only was his daughter going to be okay, but that she was going to come in with some unusual abilities. And so from the time I was very small, my dad always used to, to refer to me as promised. And that was actually how I got the title of my very first book. Um, because if ever I, I had things that had gone wrong or something happened at school or I was feeling down, he would always sit me down and remind me that I was promised. And he was referring to this visit that he had from these celestial beings. Sure. And so, of course, I was born. And other than, other than the fact that I'm slightly unusual, um, everything that one would hope is normal with a child's birth was everything was fine. <laughs> And um, so my parents were always kind of hanging out, waiting for the next part of this visit that he had to come to fruition, which was 
these unusual abilities. What were they talking about? Um, the baby was okay. They were just so relieved. Um, but they were always kind of watching. And so when I started talking, that's when it started getting interesting because my best friend as a child and to this day um, was my grandfather, Dr. Garland Clark. He was a surgeon from Kentucky and he was my, my mother's father um, and just my very best friend. And he was so wonderful with me and he would put me to bed most nights, tell me my stories. And we spoke about things that, you know, you just don't hear parents and, and children or grandparents and children talking about. We spoke about purpose and meaning and why we were here. And he would take me places, very unusual places. So when I turned about four, we had a conversation, my mother and father and I, because my dad was about ready to crack and he couldn't take it anymore because I would always come in and I'd talk to them about things that judge, which was what we called my grandfather, that a judge had told me or places he had taken me or people um, that my parents would have known that that judge knew. And so we sit down and I called it the kitchen table talk. Um, and my father had this big, deep, you know, preacher's voice, a big booming voice. And he said, sugar, do you know the difference between alive and dead? And this was when it all got really wild because my grandfather, Judge, had died when I was one. And so these conversations that I, were, that I was having with him and um, these things that I would know that only he could have told me, my parents are now having to digest the fact that they know that I couldn't possibly have known otherwise unless Judge had told me, mm. but they also knew that been dead for several years at that stage. So this was when my parents decided that this was a wonderful gift. This must be what those angelic or those celestial beings were talking about. And, um, yeah. that it was a wonderful gift, but let's not talk about it outside of here. And so this was the first kind of restriction that was placed. And I know my parents had great intentions and they didn't want me to get hurt or they didn't want anybody to take advantage of me. Um, but it was at this stage that I really began to realize that I was different. So that's actually how it all starts. So as I, as I grow up, um, as a, as a child, you know, I was extremely attracted to old people. My friends were off playing and I you know, I would play with my friends and all, but, mm. uh, I preferred to spend my time with old people. I loved the elderly. I wanted to go to the nursing home. I wanted to hang out with them. Um, it, and this was because what I could see was not just them. It was so interesting for me to watch because I was seeing things. I was seeing other people, other beings, because to me, they were as real as, as you are sitting on the other side of this screen somewhere in Texas. And I'm presuming that you're flesh and blood and that you're in a body, but I can't see you. I can't touch you. And so to me, it was just another form of being. So when my parents would try to describe the fact that judge no longer had a body, this was, it was quite perplexing to me because it was just another form of reality for me. And so they would explain that this isn't how most people see the world around them, that they didn't see people who weren't wearing a body. <laughs> so, <laughs> it was, um, it was interesting times for sure. And you know, then I started being able to know things before they would happen. Um, I would know if somebody was going to die. My, and of course that was great crack because my, my dad was the one writing the eulogies and I'd come in and announce that somebody was going to die next Tuesday and, and he better get cracking on that, uh, on that eulogy. But, um, it was an interesting childhood. And so as I grew up and became a teenager and then I went into college and you know, the last thing that you want to do is be totally different than anybody else. And of course I was well versed at this stage at not revealing my true self. Um, you know, I could blend in and, and be just like everybody else when I wanted to. And then I had this whole other world happening simultaneously. So 
when I was in college, I wasn't utilizing any of these gifts to do anything but just amuse myself. They were kind of parlor tricks. I would, I was a cheerleader. I would write down the score to the basketball game and stick it in my underwear drawer, and I'd go cheer at the game, and then we'd come back and crack open the, the beer with the dudes and pull out that envelope, and there was the score to the game, and we'd yeah. just laugh and laugh and drink another beer and so by the time December 14th 1991 rolled around I had just graduated from college and you know, I'm from the south and in the south if you're still dating the same guy that you were dating in college your parents are making plans and you know there's china patterns being picked out and silverware yeah. and yeah. crystal and you would move to where your sweetheart came from and so my sweetheart was from Charleston South Carolina and so I moved, I was from Virginia originally, and we were, I was in school in South Carolina. And so I moved to Charleston and with my big college degrees, I couldn't get a job doing anything other than mopping the floor at a sign company to start out. Uh, but it was a wonderful environment. It was awesome. The people who owned the place were absolutely wonderful because they really taught me that you needed to learn business from the bottom up. You had to have the same amount of respect for what every job um, held and how important that teamwork and community within the, the workplace was. And so I am on my way to the Christmas party. So remember at this stage, I've gone 21 years and I've got some pretty extraordinary stuff happening in my life that I'm doing absolutely nothing with. And I leave my apartment to go to the Christmas party at work. And it was Charleston. It was still hot. And I was wearing Bermuda shorts and a Santa Claus t-shirt and I was about a mile or two away from home, and I was sitting at a set of traffic lights that um, were at an intersection of a major highway, Highway 17. And I sat at my red light for quite some time, and then when it finally turned green, I started across the lanes of traffic because I was going to be turning left to go towards town. So I made it across that first lane and that second lane, and I get to that next lane, and I look left, and this was literally the the metaphorical and the metaphysical crossroads of my life because that's where everything changed. Because at that moment, everything just slowed down to a snail's pace. And I find myself sitting there looking at this car creeping towards me, realizing that I'm getting ready to die. And what was so fascinating is because being a preacher's daughter, you have all these kind of preconceived notions about what death is and what actually happens. And um, nothing like that was happening yet anyway. And I could hear this sound. And there was this low drone, this this low vibration, this low frequency playing in the back, the kind of the background around me. And as I sat in that sound... I suddenly realized that I had a choice and I could stay in my body and experience the impact if I felt like there was something I needed from that or I could take off out of the body before the car hit me. I was still I was going to die either way, but I could choose the way that I wanted to do that, what was going to serve me best. I was completely in control, and this was just crazy because this is absolutely nothing. Like, they didn't teach that in Sunday school. Um, so I took option B because, like, that car was, before everything started slowing down, it was going really fast. The police estimated at 75 miles an hour. So I made my choice, and whoop, out I went. And next thing I knew, I was witnessing everything below me and it was at that stage that that drone that sound is still in the background and once I was up and out and I was looking everything sped back up to normal speed that car came plowing towards me t-boned my car into the driver's side my head went out the driver's side window I broke my neck um, the seat folded up glass shattered windows blew out and my car is spinning around the intersection I'm just like kicked back watching this and so I've now become a witness to my own death and it was absolutely crazy because not that I'd ever really thought about what was going to happen but I certainly didn't think it was going to happen like that so I'm certainly not digging back onto some preconceived notion of, of what's going to take place because yeah. that was it so there I am 
spinning around the intersection, my body at least, and I'm, I have no interest really I, um, other than, wow, this is, you know, this is kind of cool. But I wasn't like, oh, my God, I'm too young. No, no, let me back in. No, don't take me now. Yeah. I've got so much. It was nothing like that. And the best way that I have have found to explain it to people is you're in Texas. It gets hot there. Yeah. So if you're out in the yard and you're nasty and sweaty and you've been working out all day and it's it, it's satisfying, you've done your job and you come inside and you peel off those sticky, sweaty clothes and you throw them down by the washing machine and then you go get in the shower and you just wash off all the dirt and the grime and the muck and it's just glorious. The last thing mm. that you are thinking about in that moment is the dirty clothes next to the washing machine. Yeah. And this is it. Exactly what it felt like watching my own death. Wow. Wow. And, and you know, something that you said a minute ago struck me, and that was uh, um, almost the comfort level with which you accepted this. And I, you know, I, I don't need, I don't even necessarily attribute that to a religious upbringing or anything like that. Uh, but much more, uh, I from guess, <laughs> go ahead. It was far from it. Yeah. And what, I guess at that moment you were, you were describing a ringing, uh, a droning sound. And mm -hmm. that, that for me is one of the descriptions that I give people of, of my ecstatic experience was is just a vibration that's that's the most i can give people um i was not physically there when it was happening mm -hmm. like at least not consciously there i was i was there and i felt it um but i wasn't inside of myself so a uh, very almost similar situation, but uh, at what point did did it dawn on you that um, this was something that you had chosen? Um, a little bit later, that was uh, it was it was also normal. That's what was so interesting. Huh. And when people. What's death like? It's like walking from the kitchen to the hallway. It's like leaving one room and walking into another. The 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 loss of the body, the death of 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 the form. It's just so normal because you realize, oh gosh, okay, I've done this before. This is ah, here we are, and okay. instantaneously you begin to 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 normalize. You begin to realize, oh God, that's right. This is how this works. And after having made that choice of wanting to witness as opposed to experience the actual impact, yeah. I'm sitting there watching. So that body is still appearing animated in the car, but I'm actually out of it. And I'm watching this happen. And when, when the car spins around and it goes through the intersection and it stops, and then, of course, traffic is, is stopped. Many lanes of traffic both ways have now stopped, and people are starting to congregate. And you're just observing and you're watching every, everything. What was really interesting was a girl that I'd gone to college with was a couple of cars behind me at the traffic light. And Charleston at that time, you know, this is 1991, it was, there was probably about 350,000 people in Charleston. And so the, the idea that she was only a few cars behind me um, and she didn't even live anywhere near me was really interesting. And what was also fascinating was during that time when I saw her see me and realize that that was my car and that was me in that car, I could feel what she was feeling. It was separate and distinct from me, what I was feeling. Interesting. And I could feel her, her terror. And I could feel the panic all around that, but I was completely unfazed by it and I watched um, I watched somebody come up and put their name and phone number on the front seat of the passenger side through the you know, the window was gone and um, and then I saw a guy in uniform come and reach in and 
turn the engine off so the car wouldn't blow and I'm still in there you know I'm like dead hanging in there um strapped in with the seat belt and the seats folded up underneath me and the car is completely crushed into the left side of my body and I just I was like okay that's that done and I watched all of that take place and then that sound changed and this is where it gets really fun because it went from that low drone, which I many years later have come to realize was what was actually keeping me attached to this plane, this dimension. Mm -hmm. that, low, that low vibration was sure. the way that that essence of me, that spirit, that soul remained attached to a physical body. So now all of a sudden that vibration starts speeding up. The sounds are getting brighter, more beautiful. The, the music of the spheres, we call it. It was sure. absolutely well, these are sounds I've never been able to hear, and I've spent many years trying to replicate them. Um, and so I was suddenly in that space, and bang, I was somewhere else. And it happened just like that. There was no tunnel of light for me. It was instantaneous that I went from the, the space of being able to observe what was happening in that earthly experience to being somewhere completely different. And... Uh, the by location that you're talking about, the the being able to realize that you're in two places at the same time and be OK with that. Um, the fact that it wasn't it wasn't like a fractured consciousness. It wasn't like you were experiencing something and remembering the rest is something else. Right. Exactly. Well, I was getting ready to get a big fat lesson in that. Um, after I sat in that space and I'm, you know, just, I'm just being, and I was absolutely not in any kind of distress whatsoever. It was very, very wonderful and very, very normal. And it was like taking that shower after being outside, being hot and sweaty and washing off that last 21 years. Woo. That was, <laughs> that was a while. some of that I'd love to do again. Some of it, Ooh, I don't think so. Um, but you're just bathing in this in this glorious light and uh then it changed the music is still playing all around me those those high frequencies those beautiful tones and all of a sudden i'm i'm very aware by the way at this point that i still have some kind of form i don't have a body but I'm very aware of of who I am. So my consciousness of the life that I've just left completely intact. Only I seem to be coming smarter by the second. Like I'm starting to remember stuff, and all of the all of the contractual agreements that I that I agreed to before coming here <laughs> went out the window. And th this is the the easiest description for this kind of thing is like you know if you you and I sat down. Uh, for a friendly game of Monopoly, you and I both know that I don't, I, I'm not going to buy a park place with a $500 bill that's pink. That's not happening. But we suspend reality temporarily and go and, and immerse ourselves in that game and we abide by those rules. And so once you put the game aside and you go back into your regular life, those rules no longer apply. And that's exactly what it's like when you land in that space. It's that, oh, okay, I remember what I was doing there. Oh, God, that's right. We stuff ourselves in that little meat suit. We only get five senses while we're there. Oh, yeah, that no longer applies. And when you realize that, suddenly your memory starts to return. That veil is lifted and all of those, those rules and regulations are just gone. And you remember how it all actually works. And you remember completely why you went and so I'm in that space all this is happening I'm remembering just at lightning speed and then the atmosphere in front of me starts to take shape and this was crazy um, I've tried to describe the color it, it it seems silly to even try because we don't even have the colors here but it was like this kind of rich golden caramel color with this pearly sheen to it and turn into shape and out of that step these or, or float these two beings and 
I'm sitting there and I'm looking at them and they were just so wonderful. And they looked like elderly gentlemen to me because remember I told you as a child, I just love the elderly. And so the powers that be must have decided, you know, there you are freshly dead. Let's not freak her out too much. So let's put something in front of her that, that she can connect with. And so these beings step forward and they wait and they wait and I'm looking at them and I know I'm supposed to know who they are. And then suddenly it dawns on me. And I realized that these are my guides, my guardians, that we all have them. Oh my gosh. Oh yeah, we all have them. We're never, ever, 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 ever alone. No matter how alone or separated or disconnected we feel, we're actually never, ever alone. They're always there. And it was the homecoming of all homecomings, let me tell you. And it was just so incredible. And after we connected again and I, they allowed me the time to realize who and what they were. I had what, you know, we, t we call it a life review that just, it sounds so cheesy. Um, but this is the most fascinating part of it all to me because this is, you want to talk about mind blowing stuff is already happening. My, my brain exploded that consciousness went, Oh my God. Yes. I remember now. That whole construct of time that we have there, oh God, that's not even real. Because here I am, and it was like being in the middle of a cinema, like one of those IMAX 360 degree cinemas where it's all happening around me. So I'm not watching my life and the 21 years I've just left behind as Mary Helen happen in chronological order. It's not like marching forward from two to three to four to five. It's happening simultaneously. <sighs> Mind wow. blown. Yeah. And I am watching myself get lost at Virginia Beach at five while I am learning how to drive at 15, while I'm getting my very first dog at 11, while I'm drinking too much at a party and end up in a gang rape at 17, when I'm getting my, my acceptance letter to college, when I'm cheering at a basketball game when I'm 12, I mean, it's all happening at the same time. And suddenly it makes complete sense. You know, because I always said, boy, but there better be a movie when I die, buddy. You better believe there's a movie. And the movie's all happening simultaneously. <laughs> I, to break it down, to make it easy for people to conceptualize, imagine if you were on a merry-go-round and you were in the center of the merry-go-round and you're in a park and let's say take north and at, at the north end of the park, there's a little dog sitting there wagging his tail and on the east side, there's a man in an ice cream truck serving cones and then there's a mother playing with her child behind you and then to your left, there's kids playing in a water fountain. Now, as I'm on the merry-go-round and I'm spinning, I spin past the guy with the ice cream cones and then I spin past that dog and then I spin past that fountain, but they're all happening simultaneously. Just because I'm viewing one at a time as I spin past, all events are taking place at the same time. We live concurrently. So when we're talking about the concept of, of a divine or supreme being able to be in all places at once, this is actually how that's happening. When we talk about past lives, I am guilty as charged for speaking to my sure. audiences and trying to break it down um, into a way that they can they can digest because it's it's pretty uh, it, that's a tough pill to swallow. It's a complex issue. It's a complex it's, issue. It, yes. Yeah. So, there you go. Yeah. Work. <laughs> well, and that's just it. You know, it's um, it's like I try because a, a lot of the reason I had people like you on Sev Talk, Aaron, like I said before, um, is because I want to understand other people's filter. I want to understand the unique way in which they view the world because of the experience they've had. Um, and that's just, uh, that's, that's just a quirk in my psyche. It's just one of those things like, um, people who have had experiences like that fascinate me. And I guess it's because I myself have had my own experiences like that. Um, where, yeah, when I tell most people about them, they look at me and go, yeah, all right, buddy. 
Um, <laughs> you know, another... I mean, like when I tell, like I spent my first year in college as a seminarian. Uh, studying to be a priest. And, uh, you, you know, I, of course, I'm married. I got a kid. I obviously did not follow that path. Um, but I taught people spirituality and religion for years afterward. I was assistant youth minister, all kinds of stuff. And I was deeply involved with helping people on a spiritual path because I felt called to it from my experience. Um and, and that's that's a big reason why I still do this show is because it's just a continuance of that mission for me. Uh, it's all knowledge with a capital K. It's all not truth with a capital T, you know, mm-hmm. and, and without understanding these things, without taking the moment to hear a story like yours from your mouth, uh, Dr. Hensley, I think that we as people do ourselves and the world a disservice um, when we brush these things aside. And, and that's whether you are you have a spiritual background or a scientific background or not. Um, I, I'm just one of those people that thinks that knowledge is a great thing. Um, Me too. Lear, Me lear, too. Learn as much as you can. Keep reading. Don't stop. Don't stop. Exactly trying to learn Uh, and it's interesting said about the filter you know that people are seeing it through their different filters well what the the big aha in that moment was oh my gosh we're all fractals of the same whole yeah so when we talk about the divine being in all places at once that's actually that that essence of who we actually are that has shattered into a gazillion pieces and is walking around in this plane and you know not to mention all the others that are out there but in this plane walking around in eight billion plus costumes viewing the eye viewing the world and the experience of being on earth through eight billion plus different sets of eyes and different sets of filters yeah And that's how we see all things at once. And so that's really where that, that old truth, you know, do unto others as you do unto yourself. It's the, it's because that's what you're actually doing. You are literally interacting with another piece of yourself, just dressed up in a whole different outfit, raised in a different set of circumstances, you know, with different criteria, um, as to what value and worth mean and with a different agenda on living, but ultimately we're all part of that same whole. And so this was just fascinating to me. So that was that whole talk about having to come back in and reinvent everything, you know, to be true because I carry that memory with me. Um, A lot of, people who've had that the near death experience will talk about the feeling, the love, the elation, um, that complete belonging and mm. how wonderful that is. Really at the end of the day, that's all that really matters is that feeling because that's all we are is is sure. feelings, right? Vibrations, frequencies. Yeah. Um but coming back into this world, jumping back into the monopoly game with the knowing that there's actually something else outside, that's been challenging sometimes because you just want to shake people. But but you know what? They're here and they're playing with those blinders on for a reason. That's right. They're to experience the world in in the way that they've chosen with it with the different talents with the different gifts with the with the handicaps with the disadvantages all of those are by choice and you know people are like i'd never ever 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 choose to to have gone through what i've gone through i'd never choose to be ill or i'd never choose to be poor i'd never choose to be this or that we do and we did and that's an interesting thing because when you think about it when you are not in in the mortal coil when you are sitting in the whole of yourself and that and then that divine understanding and that veil has been lifted and you understand how all of this works of course you're going to choose the hardships and the difficulties because you know that that's the real meat and potatoes about being a human being yeah. that this is such a fascinating world and it's so unique because we operate and function in duality that dichotomy of dark and light 
that is available to us simultaneous here is unique to the earth experience. And that's why so many souls choose to come here to incarnate because it's different. There's so many types of experiences that we can have, but this earthly experience, the unique opportunity to experience bliss and joy and simultaneous agony and hardship, that is what makes this place so amazing. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I think going back for just a second where you were talking about the appreciation that you have um, after you come back with the understanding. Uh, and I think I think that that was a big moment for me when because uh, um, y there's two ways to go. You either go down the road of embitterment for a little while and then you come back or you fully understand from the beginning and the get go. Um, I was one that went down the road of bitterness for a little while. Um, mm -hmm. because, and it, utterly self-inflicted, utter, like, you know, with the wisdom that I have years later, it's one of those like, ha ha, awesome. Um, you know, but at the same time, uh, to understand it with those eyes now and to understand the fact that because I chose to dwell on that lower vibration, literally, um, mm -hmm. that lower self-fulfilling vibration instead of focusing on the higher one that I knew existed, uh, I kept myself down there through, through well, a series of my own decisions. What better way then to lend a hand to somebody else who's there sure. and help them out? Because listen, all of us, we'd rather learn from somebody who's experienced something. You know, look, I've... I've been a doctor for nearly 25 years, and I have to say those moments when I'm able to connect with somebody who will describe some freaky sensation that nobody can get to the bottom of and no doctor has ever been able to figure out, and they just, you know, maybe it's a figment of their imagination or they're just really stressed out or they've been sent home and told, you need, you need to go relax and just yeah. go have a glass of um, <laughs> When you can actually connect with somebody on the level of, I actually know what that feels like. And one of the beautiful things that this accident afforded me was every injury known to man. And I have had some yeah. of the freakiest, freakiest ailments because of this. Um, I had extensive damage to my vagus nerve. And as we know, the vagus is where it's at, baby. And um, so I have experienced the most bizarre sets of circumstances. Just the other day, I was uh, I was in the hardware store, and my daughters looked at me, and they're like, "Are you okay?" And I was like, "I look really anxious," and I just felt, I felt like this weird anxiety, and and they were like, "Do you need to go to the bathroom?" And I went, "Yeah, yeah, I actually do. My body can't register; it can't tell the difference of it. Do I need yeah. to poop or my heart? Do yeah. I want to cry?" Yeah. Um, and that part of that that uh, Vegas complex. And I'm actually writing a book with a friend on that, um, in 2021 called lost Vegas. <laughs> um, talk about it. the, to talk about the importance of that and how it's actually a virtual live feed to our higher selves. It's that part of us that allows feel and connect so deeply, but it's like doing a Facebook live. So that higher self, that higher vibe, that essence of you that remains outside of the earth plane, the vagus nerve actually acts like a transmitter. It's, it's literally a live broadcast of what you're feeling, seeing, experiencing. It's running it through, through a different filter so that your higher self can then record those, um, record those experiences. Some people like to talk about the Akashic records and they, you know, that's exactly what this is. It's a live feed. Those records are those feelings and vibrations that you experienced, whether, you know, through in the human experience through five different emotions um, and through a set of feelings of um, through the parasympathetic and sympathetic nervous system. Um, and it's just fascinating. I think it's so amazing. So um, yeah, I think it's, it's something that needs to actually be discussed because it's just yet another way to have the experience. And so when you can actually sit down, the girl that I'm writing this book with um, my friend Maeve, I'll never forget the look on her face when she described this sensation that she was having and she had broken her own neck and had, had very similar injuries to what I had. And I went, yeah, exactly. And it, it went like this. And then you felt like this. And she's like, Oh my God, 
because she hadn't been able to connect with anyone who knew exactly what she was feeling. And so, you know, it's really valuable to uh, to have had all of these injuries. And I've had like, you name it, I've had it. I've had cancer and rape. Wow. I've had it because that's how I've chosen to use this body. Um, because it allows me to connect with people because uh, I value I value my body, of course. I value the, the, the fact that it helps me to navigate and traverse this human experience. Um, but I value it very differently than I would have as a 21 year old, mm. you know, just my yeah. big in the boobs perky. Um, do you know that whole thing kind of goes out the window? You see yourself in a completely different light. You realize that rather than trying to reach this perfect, uh, perfect body, um, as you move towards ha having your enlightened spiritual experience, that your body's actually working for you, that it is perfectly designed to allow you to interact in a, in a sensory infused experience with people around you, with the, with feelings around you, with all of the, the atmosphere that we live in, um, with different challenges, with different exciting things. Yeah. Um, body is designed to literally respond to those things. And it is the best truth meter that we could ever have. Oh, absolutely. And when we're not on course, when we're not doing what we ourselves came here to do, the body will go ding, ding, ding. Hey, pay yeah. attention. Yeah. You know, and it could be in the form of a pain. It could be in the form of an illness. It could be in the form of of um, a mental health issue. It could be. It's incredible what it does. And but we don't like to be uncomfortable anymore. Yeah, we have become so lazy when it comes to being uncomfortable we'll pop a pill we'll t you know do whatever it takes not to experience pain pain has become the eminent enemy when in actuality it's part of that beautiful mechanism of that of that truth meter yeah. and um well i'm just always trying to tell people especially you know especially like in chiropractic when they're coming in and they're like bent over backwards and they're mm. oh, i can't move that's all that i'm like what is that trying to tell you yeah how did that happen? Because, and nine times out of 10, it was something, it wasn't necessarily that they, oh, you know, lifted something too heavy or tripped and fell or something like that. Somebody might've buried their father last week. Somebody yeah. might be having serious issues at home with a spouse. Um, it's, it's that mind, body, spirit connection that you realize Absolutely. is so important on all levels. No one is more important than the other. Well, and it's, it's interesting that you bring that up because that, that, absolutely transitions us into the second reason that I brought you on, which is your work with healing frequencies. And I, I myself am a practitioner of such things. I use music like that. Uh, one of the, one of the albums, uh, that oddly enough, my wife enjoys going to sleep to, uh, is one that I wrote a few years ago, uh, Pranathana, which actively uses, uh, the pure tone of each chakra behind the mm -hmm. music um mm -hmm. and uh i've been i've been using this for years uh for my own use and been putting into putting it to music and it's always been fun for me to um even use psychoactive frequencies in the background of other music to purposefully make people uncomfortable um <laughs> th things like that you know uh, well to to literally ex help exude an emotion that I am trying to get across with a piece exactly. of music, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and when they go, wow, that made me feel really uncomfortable. Like, Good. Um, <laughs> like it was supposed to. Um, and for me, it's, it's always come down to the point of, um, like I was saying a while ago, my, once I realized that I myself was keeping myself at, from success and from being a better person uh, for myself, for my family, uh, because I dwelt on negative energy, uh, because I dwelt on negative frequencies, things that happened that were something that was just passing had I let it just pass and move on. And even... Go ahead. You set up camp. Yeah. And that's one of the 
biggest things is that w- that one of the biggest traps that people fall into with the with the human emotions is that um, rather than just experiencing and feeling and letting it pass, um, we cling on to and yeah. literally you know, pitch the old campfire, get out the stick and the marshmallows, yeah. and the, you know we're, we're making some more. Next thing you know, it we're we're really comfortable in that particular emotion. And for a lot of people, they don't tend to do that in joy. They tend to do that in the things that that make them feel less than or that challenge sure. their their feelings of worth and value as as human beings. Yeah, and I mean even even myself when. A- uh, when I was diagnosed with anxiety many years ago, just before I got married, I, I passed out in public. Um, that's how I found out about it. Uh, it was it was just like somebody hit the reset button and walked off. Uh, I saw the footage. It was crazy. Um, and I went to the doctor, started getting on some medication, and started going to a little talk therapy for a little while. And it was my therapist, Joe, at the time. Um, who who explained it to me that it's like a train, Chris, and the train is there, and there's nothing you can do about the train. You, for some reason, want to get to the place that you want to get to despite the train being there. And you could try to outrun the train if you want. You probably won't be able to. Uh, or you could try to go through the train, and that won't go well for you. Or you could just realize that there's a train there. Wait. And the train will go by. Amen. Stop Stop worrying about how to get past it. How to just stay still, be still, and let it pass by. Um, and it was then that I really got to dig down inside myself and start to realize the source of my anxiety is because I care a lot. I care a lot about some things. And when, when something happens that tilts that control or shifts that control over something that I care so much about, um, that it rocks my paradigm. Absolutely. And that's why the use of frequency is, is so important in the, in the mm. work that I do now, because it's, um, you know, we don't like to feel anymore Yeah, and we get, busy and so distracted and but we have no problems allowing ourselves to feel the negative emotions yeah. um and you know like i said we pitched tent there and um because that anxiety and somehow we feel like that validates us that means that we're doing you know that we're, we're 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 doing for other people or we're doing what we need to do or not and i'm like that's only one part of it yeah and we get stuck in that space and so using frequency actually will bypass all that bs that's going on and it will allow someone to actually feel you know to get them into a space where they can unplug for a moment and you're you're speaking the actual love language Mm -hmm. of the soul as opposed to trying to speak to their logical mind um because people have notions and concepts and ideas and we've gotten really good at overriding what's right in front of our faces yeah. in order to try and conform to what we think we know to be true. Yeah. And it really is that relinquishing of control and understanding that like, hey man, like, like Joe said, there's a train there. Why don't you just wake up and realize there's a train there? Deal with that first. <laughs> like, if you got to deal with anything, just deal with the fact that there's a train there and there's nothing you can do about it. And be okay with that. That's be, so hard. Be, for be okay with the fact that there is nothing you can do about it. And letting go of control is so difficult for people. And it the funniest is. part of great big joke is that you're literally in control of all of this. Yeah. And when people learn how to use frequency in their everyday life, when people understand that there's literally a frequency for every human organ, for every chakra, for everything that happens within the energy field, the mind, the body, the spirit, all of it, every emotional state, everything has a frequency. And when you learn how to utilize those frequencies, life changes and you realize that you literally have um, there's a blueprint, there's an outline, there's, there's, there are tools available to help you completely change the way that you're experiencing the world around you. And that's why I love the work with frequency so much. Um, you know, it started for me after the accident. Um, I, I ended up 
I just came back hardwired differently and I have synesthesia. And so I, I oh, wow. hear cancer. Um, I can smell death. I can taste someone's emotional state. It is, you know, and unless you wow. have ever experienced it's really, it sounds crazy and it is kind of crazy, but that's the way that the world works for me. And sure. so, um, I've been able to utilize that with people because when I can hear something going on in the body, it's no different than if I've got two, if I have two guitars in a room and I pluck the E string on one, the E string on the other guitar is going to vibrate. And so if I can go in and I can match frequency with that altered DNA, with that genetic mutation, with whatever it is that with that depression, that anxiety, if I can go in and, and match pitch with that and the body is finished with it, if the body has accomplished what it needs to in order to assist the spirit in what it's here to learn and it's ready to let that go, you can annihilate that with frequency literally on the spot. And, and that's the big miracle. Well, let's get into that for a moment. I have this track here. Uh, let me see if I can bring it up. I can't tell if I'm muted or not over there. Whoop. Ah, I see what's wrong. There we go. Uh, this is a track that I have written for an upcoming album that I am working on. Uh that incorporates theta frequencies in the background for deep meditation, uh, relaxation, things like that. And also incorporates, a, you may be pretty familiar with it, the sound of a cicada in the background. Uh, uh -oh. That to me, <laughs> that to me, like the rhythmic sound of cicadas in the trees is one of the most relaxing things in the world. Uh, and I mean, this video also goes on with all kinds of crazy, uh, hypnotic stuff, everything else, mm -hmm. Ka kaleidoscopic videos going on with it, all kinds of things. But, um, it's something that, like I said, I have been incorporating into my music and using for myself for years and trying to expose people to and have them understand the concept of entrainment. Exactly. And exactly. I was very blessed to years ago meet a fellow in Los Angeles called Greg Papagna. Um, he has, you'd be fascinated with all of his work. It's signsmusic.com, yep. S-I-N-E-S, -E Signs Music. And so it was great because I was able to, when, when Greg and I are the best of friends and I was able to approach him and go, look, I need this. I need, I need to, I need to be able to run through the organs in six minutes. I need to be able to do this. I need to be able to do that. And he, he's just like, bang, turned it out because he understood sure. the music that he uses. He's, he's, you know, gone out of, um, 440 into 432, yeah. um, understands the concept of how music and the way that we listen to it, um, can become a completely immersive experience. And it's like, I was just telling you, I have an upcoming audiobook. understanding is the new healing. And it's the first one in audible history that uses these frequencies because I'm telling, I'm sharing stories from 20 plus years of facilitating healing sessions with people. So, you know, this one might be about a past life. This one might be about someone's experience with cancer. This one might be about suicide and behind each of those stories are not only the brainwave states to allow them to really engage with the story, but the frequencies that immerse them into the feeling of the story. And the idea behind it is they might not have the exact same story as the one that I'm telling, but they might connect with something that's very similar within their own lives. And when they make that connection, that frequency is playing in the background and literally handing them a passport to freedom. And so I'm really, really excited about this project and it should be out on Audible in a, in a few days time. But it's just it's that whole thing that we're discussing here is that immersive experience. It's taking it from mm. from just audio or audible experience to something that's incorporating the entire being. Yeah. The energy, of the individual, as well as the physical body of the individual. And that's a very interesting uh, way to incorporate that technology is to use it in storytelling um what a what an amazing way to actively get somebody to begin to feel the way that the character felt while sharing that 
Exactly. And so now when I'm when I'm facilitating these um, healing sessions, you know, because I came back after the accident and they were like, okay, if you're going back, you're going to go back a little bit enhanced. And I'm like, all right, I can already see dead people. What's next? And suddenly I come back and I have this ability to like download somebody's hard drive. And so I can see like a mind movie of if they've come to me with a particular challenge of something that could have taken place at any stage during the course of this lifetime or a concurrent lifetime that's causing them not to be able to move forward. And when I can go in and connect through frequency with that experience, we can actually remove that little roadblock and move forward. And um, I, I use, um, there's a, a doctor in California, Dr. Stephen Schwartz, who came up with this technology by Harmonics. Um, and it's a table. And this table is just chocker block full of speakers that actually deliver the frequency through the the entire individual's body so not just through headphones yeah. into their ears literally a full body experience and it is so incredible how how much faster people are are getting the results that they're looking for oh absolutely and, through use of sympathetic resonation things like that basically turning the table itself into a speaker uh, into a speaker and, yeah. and and thus the person becomes a, a speaker and yep. um so teaching people then to go and this is the work that I've been doing with Greg for these years is is creating these little packages of, of these different frequencies different meditations different immersive um, listening experiences and going here guess what you don't have to die to access this I did because I was just farting around for 21 years not using what I had so I had to go through this accident sure and I that up for myself my great big challenge my choice which is so important it, my, my understanding that that's what free will is, is I had the choice not to use all of those amazing things that I could do and I chose not yeah. to yeah um you know, I did it when it felt when I you know when I wanted to or uh, the stuff like the dreams and the knowing when people would die that just happened regardless and so you know what did I get out of that to, in the early days insomnia um so once I set this accident up for myself, if I had not reached adulthood with some kind of direction as to how I was going to help utilize these gifts to as a, as a steward to humanity, um, I had this accident waiting in the wings so that I could knock myself out of the body, back into that memory, and come back in and carry on. And that's exactly what I did. And so from that day forward, I started using the ability to, to connect in with these stories, this, these people's biographies, and, and literally utilizing frequency to, to alter the biology. Um, and it's been utterly fascinating. But the, 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 the big kicker, anyone can do it. Yeah. What most people lack is the discipline to do it. So don't ever be fooled and think that, oh, everybody wants to be perfectly well and healthy. They do not because that's not part of the human experience for everybody. Yeah. Some people are here in order to experience the pain and the hardship and the illnesses in order to move on or to experience something. And far be it from me to judge that or try and take that away because trust in the early days, you find out you can heal. Oh, hey, I can heal cancer. My ego was on fire. I was loving life. Do you know? Oh, that's the girl that can talk to the dead and can heal, heal the disease. Yes, woohoo! Yeah. And then I grew up, and then some maturity set in, and then I realized what I was actually here to do, and it wasn't about me. And that's when I became a window washer. I started wiping the windows clean so people could find out for themselves that they already are that which they seek, that everything they need is already here. Yeah. Well, doctor, thank you so much for taking the time to come on. I'd love to have you on again to talk more about healing frequency work, to talk more about near-death experiences. Uh, this has been a fantastic conversation. I have thoroughly enjoyed the parts of bringing death to life that I've read so far, and I cannot wait to finish the book as well as get Promised by Heaven and understanding is the new healing uh, those are all available on the dudes and beer store everybody we will also be adding the new audible uh book what is the name of it again doctor 
Understanding is the new healing. Great. Yeah, once that is available, please do send us a link, and we'll make sure to add that to our store as well. Uh, so Absolutely. your whole oeuvre will be available for our audience. Um, <laughs> one, one final time, uh, shameless self-promotion time, Doctor. Tell them where they can go other than the Dudes and Beer store to find your books, to get healing work done uh, with frequencies, to find out more about the work that you do. Uh everything else where where can they go one stop shop it's mary helen hensley.com that is the way i like it right there somebody that has their website and that's where they point everybody um i man uh, i could do whole episodes and have on that on my other podcast um because it is so important so i'm glad to see that you have those horses wild under rain already uh <laughs> Please do hold the line while we close things out, Doctor. I would love to speak with you off air. Everybody, while you are online, checking out the great work of our guest, Dr. Mary Helen Hensley, please do make sure to stop on by Dudes and Beer podcast. Dudesandbeer.com is the website. That's where you can find the Knowledge Vault with all of the declassified government programs, uh, scientific documents, including the Hemisync Brain Process which really goes into a lot of what we were talking about with brainwave entrainment, things like that. Um, go check that out. Uh, dudesandbeer.com forward slash knowledge is how you can get to the knowledge vault. Forward slash store is how you can get to the store while you're online checking that out. Make sure to stop on by HC Universal Network. That is our parent network. Um, great shows on there. Yes, but why podcast? Gary Dad podcast. Uh, coming to you soon, some some more uh, Richard Spazoff show, all kinds of good stuff. HCUniversalNetwork.com. Until next time, everybody, take care Thanks of yourselves. To this take care of each of other. You can't podcast. be good. Be good at it. To listen to our audio streams or chat with us live, download the official Dudes and Beer app for Android and iDevices, available on Google Play and iTunes markets. For more episodes, content, and information, visit us online at dudesandbeer.com. You can also find our episodes on Breach.tv, iHeartRadio, Spreaker, SoundCloud, iTunes, YouTube, Stitcher, or your favorite podcast service. Dudes and Beer is a proud member of the HC Universal Network family of podcasts. For more about our sponsors and other podcasts on this network, visit hcuniversalnetwork.com. Thanks for listening, everybody. And until next time, drink responsibly.